OK, so hi there. Um, I'm Max. I'm going to be talking about making Black Eyed Poetry with computers. And so before I talk about that, I should probably talk about what Black Eyed Poetry actually is. Um, so for those of you who might not be familiar necessarily, um, Black Eyed Poetry looks like this. Or this is at least one way that it looks. And this is sort of newspaper Black Eyed Poetry specifically. This was created by Austin Cleon. Um, and Austin Cleon has a blog and a book about newspaper Black Eyed Poetry that are sort of specifically, I think, credited with popularizing Black Eyed Poetry to, to many of the audiences that are familiar with it today. Um, so you can see here that basically what he's done is he's taken these pages of newspapers and he's gone in and he's sort of like blacked out, scribbled over most of the text in these newspapers, and he's left behind just a few words. And the few words that are left behind constitute a sort of poem. Um, so you can sort of read these out for yourselves. Um, I like them. They're often kind of like short and funny and sort of punchy. Um, this is a sort of style that he prefers. Um, I'm going to read out a couple here. So after a few years in the world, every person on the planet is an archaeological artifact. And then also we've got one that sort of describes my state of mind last night when I was too excited about this talk to really sleep. Um, 24 tabs open and no idea of the time. <laughs> so this one really like speaks to my soul here. And you can get a sense of why I like this so much. Um, now there's other kinds of Black Eyed Poetry as well. And one of the things that I really like about Black Eyed Poetry is that it can sort of be read as a form of creative subversion of a source text. So on the left we've got a page from a hummament by Tom Phillips. So that might be pronounced a hummament. I'm not sure. Um, it's a human document. Um, and what he's done here is he's taken sort of a, a secondhand book and he's gone through and for each of these hundreds of pages basically scribbled out over it, um, I, uh, removed most of the words, drawn in his own custom illustrations over a lot of it, um, picked these weird colors to, to sort of scribble out a lot of it with, and what's left behind is a poem that has nothing to do with the source text. So the, um, dreadful, that photograph posed, I dare say, of the dark work at Smyrna and what is this, the works at Bucharest going silently on. Um, I have no idea what that means or what it has to do with the source text, probably nothing. Um, but it's got sort of this interesting like, reinterpretation of the source text where it's just got some words in common and that's it. There's no other like, real significance to it. And then on the right-hand side, we've got um, something that I generated with the tool I'm talking about today, which is from a neural network sort of machine learning blog post, I believe. Um, These times believe neural cheers. This neural light is a facade. Um, and sort of a well-placed <laughs> warning regarding certain emerging technologies here, I think. Um, and so what you can see here is basically, even though the author's intent was to sort of like maybe even talk up or like be in, in favor of these, these sort of neural network technologies, um, you can take uh, Black Eyed Poetry and use it as a way to sort of like subvert that meaning or to sort of do something that the author with, um, would never intend with those words. Um, and one more thing that I've encouraged people to do is to, um, when someone powerful does a bad post, do a bad poetry to it through the magic of computers. Um, <laughs> So if someone in venture capital, for instance, has made a bad blog post, or if the New York Times has made, maybe made, uh, posted a bad opinion piece, um, you, can make out, you can make some really great black hole poetry that sort of like reveals um, sort of the hidden biases in this, um, sort of uses the words against the author, stuff like that. Um, so another thing I really like about black hole poetry is that it's kind of a subtractive form of procedural generation if you implement it on a computer. And what this means is that a lot of the time when we look at procedural generation, we think of it as sort of this additive um, sort of... Um, cumulative process where you're sort of building out something or taking a small seed and expanding it out. You see this in like text generation for Twitter bots. You see this in like sort of level generation for Minecraft or other uh, kinds of games. Um, but there's other forms of creativity that are more subtractive or transformative of the input. Um, and one of these is sculpture. So you can sort of think of black eyed poetry as being a form of like sculpture with marble but for text. And on the right, you've got something that is called the Days Left for Boatings and Water. So Liza Daly implemented this for um, National Novel Generation Month, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, and it is a black eyed poetry generator that she ran on something by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley um, that produced um, pages like this. And so this is sort of the algorithm that I'm adapting in my own work in this case. So getting around to that, implementing a black eyed poetry generator, and this is something that I've already done. You can go look at this web page and it will have sort of the, the browser bookmark that you can download and press the button to turn a web page into black eyed poetry. Um, so one thing that you could do is you could just black out random words, which something called the deletionist already exists and does. Um, but you get stuff like this, which is not exactly the sort of like structural stuff that I enjoy about the, the examples I showed you already. So instead, we're going to do something that's more na uh, sort of natural language processing heavy. We're going to take a source input, which is in this case sort of a sentence from my blog. Space in science fiction frequently plays the role of the final frontier. Um, we're going to go through this and we're going to say, for each of these, what part of speech is it? And there's a lot of libraries that do this. I use something called POSJS for part of speech JavaScript. But you can, there's any number of tools that let you do this. And then um, we can take that and we can sort of like um, expand it out to a whole bunch of copies of it, and we can do some fuzzy sequence matching on these copies. So for each of these, I'm creating a matcher. A matcher is a little object that has sort of like a pattern that it's looking for of parts of speech. So the one up top is looking for a noun, followed by an adverb, followed by a verb, followed by a determiner, followed by an adjective, followed by a noun. And the one below that is looking for a noun, followed by a verb, followed by a determiner, followed by a noun, and so on and so forth. Um, and they can also have, in, uh, crucially between these words, other words that it's just ignoring. And those are the words that get blacked out in the sort of output if this matcher wins. Um, so what we do is we go in and we sort of say to each of these matchers, here's the first word. Do you want this word? Do you want to match this word? Um, it's a noun, space. So 
Um, all of them could say yes. Um, randomly, two of them flip a coin and say no, but the rest of them say yes, so they keep that word. And then we move on to the next word, and we do the same thing. And we do it over and over and over again until we're sort of at the end of the text. And we get sort of five distinct readings of this text. Um, space frequently plays the final frontier. Science plays the role. Fiction plays the final frontier, or fiction plays the frontier, or space frequently plays, um, all of which are interesting. And then this fourth one here has sort of failed to match anything. It got space, it got plays, it got the, and then it hit the end of the text and can't match anything more. So at that point, you're sort of left with a bad uh, output that you can just sort of throw out. OK, so that's cool. Um, and then there's also this grammar thing that the matchers have to keep track of, because it turns out that um, some verbs and some, no or some nouns are incompatible with one another. You need to worry about like, the count of your noun versus the count of your verb. The pronoun I needs to be handled specially, because you can't say I is, you have to say I am, stuff like that. And then also like the articles A and an, you care about like, what the first letter of the word that follows it is going to be. OK, so that's all well and good. Um, generation is fine, and we produce some really cool stuff with it. We can produce stuff like this, which is one of my favorite outputs ever. Um, the mission is the infinite variability that poetry can speak. I think this is like really personally beautiful, right? Like I love this a lot, but it's also a beautiful lie. Um, and the reason it's a lie is because these are two separate paragraphs, and the computer has no idea that these two paragraphs are related at all. Um, the generator looks at each paragraph and tries to turn it into a separate piece of blackout poetry, basically. So we've got actually two sentences here. The mission is the infinite variability, which is OK, I guess. And that poetry can speak, which is, I think, not actually even grammatical. Um, so the, the really great thing here is that because these two things are juxtaposed, even though the computer has no idea they're juxtaposed, it produces a better work of poetry overall than the computer itself can actually do. So what I really want, and what I really found myself doing more and more, was sort of applying a human filter to the stuff that was coming out of this generator and being like, OK, it's produced this stuff for me. I'm going to use this as raw material for my own sort of poetry creation. Um, so here's, um, these are all from a single source text, basically. These are six distinct um, entries from a single source text. I, what I did was I sort of reran the generator on this text over and over again. You can see on the left that these are all um, instances of what the generator produces when um, run on the same paragraph. So a virtual reality is a language, a world is a language, a world is a way. And these are all variations of the same underlying text. But you have to press the button over and over again and sort of like randomize it over and over again to get these. So what the tool is not doing for me is really giving me the ability to like explore the space in the way that I find myself doing more and more. So what I really want to move towards in the future um, is sort of empowering users to talk back to the source text, like giving users more of a creative choice, basically, um, and sort of letting them do, this, do things like this to Reddit comments. Um, <laughs> so what I'm actually doing is I'm implementing now a mixed initiative Blackout Poetry composition tool. And that will be at that same URL eventually when I get it working, which I wanted to do for this talk, but which is not happening. Um, <laughs> so. What I really also want to do is to enable users to create by reacting. So the creative process is made of decisions, right? There's a whole bunch of decisions. Some of them are consequential. Some of them are totally inconsequential. And it's really easy to get hung up on the inconsequential ones. Um, so what you really want to do, and what I really want to do here specifically, is to sort of like narrow down the decision space to only decisions that we know are interesting, so that we can then sort of prevent the player or the user with like a, a set of options they can pick between. And each of those options is a good option, basically. So let's start with something like this. We've got some text here. This is from Kate Compton's blog. Um, we black out everything on it. Um, we, we sort of have these three lavender sort of things that are highlighted. When you hover over one of these, it's a possible word that you could pick for the first word of your poem. And you can, pick, you can click on one to lock it in. So we have right here, we have the da here. We like the for some reason, so we click it to lock it in. We get three more options. And so we pick a like artifact here. And we can keep on doing this indefinitely until we get to the end and we have produced a poem. Like, like basically we're repeating this loop until we are a poet. And at any stage, <laughs> you only have to worry about three distinct possibilities. You don't have to worry about the whole poem. And you can also always go back to a previous step if you want to. So basically, what I want to do is to sort of use this generative process to give players or users a way to like explore the possibility space of what they could create, explore the decision space without being overwhelmed by the size of it. Um, and so what, one thing we have to do to implement this is going to be sort of exhaustively searching poem space. My old algorithm is very probabilistic. It can miss a lot of possibilities. This is some JavaScript console output from when I was like um, killing my browser by making it loop and sort of search the whole space on one of my blog posts. Um, and then also I'm going to start using something called ASP, which is answer set programming, which is basically a form of constraint logic programming to more naturally encode some of the rules that we're looking at for like matching sort of sentences within these larger texts. So this one, we have like the, the example of the big moose is very large. They are huge, which is utter gibberish, but it works for this example. Um, and you can see that each of these has a part of speech. Each of these has like a position in the sentence. And each of these has like a sort of count or compatibility with other words. So we write these rules that are like basically like logic rules looking for um, a way to express the constraints in such a way that we can find subsets of larger texts that look like the kind of thing we're trying to find, basically. 
Okay, so takeaways from all of this. Number one, blackout poetry is cool. Number two, subtractive procedural generation is cool. Turning generators into mixed initiative creative text is cool, or creative tools is cool. Um, enabling users to create by reacting is cool. This thing that I've created already is cool. It'll have a better thing there in the future, but we're not worried about that right now, and thank you. <laughs>